Grab a Bible if you need one. Seize one from the hands of yon wandering usher. And turn to a couple places. We're going to start in Luke chapter 1. We're going to end in Psalm 43. Luke chapter 1 and Psalm 43. I had a conversation with a friend actually a while ago. Um, It was a year or two ago. I don't remember how long ago. But she asked Christmas Eve, does that not get boring after a while? How many times can you teach Luke chapter 2? She doesn't go to church here. I, I think it was... I think I was here for 10 years before, before we went to Luke 2 on, uh, on a Christmas Eve. Part of that is because the very first, it was a Sunday after Christmas. It was like Christmas was a Friday or a Saturday, and, and I was an intern, and, and it fell to me to teach that next that next Sunday. And so I decided to teach all of Luke chapter 2. Mary and the shepherds and dedication of Jesus and Simeon and Anna. And I scarred me and never wanted to do that again. So I didn't for a long time. But, but I mean, for a long time here, we went anywhere but on Christmas Eve. We, we went prophecy a bunch of years. And, and we looked at Jesus' ancestry once or twice. There was, a, there was a Christmas where we, where we explored all of the Christmas fallacies. And, and since then, all of you have put your wise men on the other side of the living room for the rest of your nativity set. And, 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 and what about the wise men? How did they know? What set them in motion? Yeah, it was a star, but why did they know what the star signified? And, uh, but, you know, the funny thing is, is that we could teach uh, Luke 2. We could look together at Luke chapter 2 every single Christmas and we would still find new things to talk about and we can go anywhere but Luke 2 because Jesus is on every page, right? There's not a chapter of scripture that isn't in some way, shape, or form about Christ and therefore about Christmas. But as we get ready for Christmas this year, tonight I want to do something a little different. Instead of looking for Jesus in the Bible, or I should say instead of just looking at Jesus in the Bible. I want to spend some time looking at things that the Bible doesn't even talk about. Things that, that don't directly concern Jesus or, or anything else biblical. There's a 400 year period between the close of the Old Testament, somewhere between 430 BC and 400 BC. There's a 400 year period ish between that and the birth of Jesus sometime 4, 5, 6 B.C. A 400-year period, plus or minus, about which the Bible says nothing, unless you count the Apocrypha, and we don't. So, The Bible doesn't talk about four centuries. And that's not unusual in and of itself. The Bible contains history, but the Bible is not a history book. There's big chunks of human history about which the Bible says absolutely nothing. And even those times that the Bible explores in great detail, times that the Bible talks a lot about, are mostly from the perspective of a single region, ignoring the whole rest of the planet. Because the Bible is less about history, right, than about his story. And his story centers around his people, Israel until Pentecost, and then it centers around us, and then after the rapture, it'll center around Israel again. But all of that being said, we're left with a gap in his story between the Old and New Testaments. A gap that that Galatians alludes to. Paul in Galatians 4.4 says, When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. When the fullness of time had come, when the perfect time arrived. What made the time that Jesus was born the perfect time? And why did 400 years have to pass between Malachi speaking the last words of the Old Testament and Matthew giving us the first words of the New Testament? And does that long stretch of time have anything to do with the even longer stretch of time in which we dwell waiting for the second coming? Let's, let's, start, let's go, to, go to Malachi, or, or I think we've got it on the screen. Malachi, the last words of the Old Testament. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. 
And Jewish scribes understood that that was messianic, that that referred to the coming of the Christ. And sure enough, Jesus, before his ministry, was, there was his cousin, John the Baptist, who came in the power of Elijah, fulfilling Malachi's prophecy, preaching repentance. But that's more than 400 years later. After God spoke those words through Malachi, he falls silent. Fulfilling, by the way, Psalm 74, verse 9. Psalm 74, 9, we do not see our signs. There's no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. Israel knew that God had ceased to speak through the prophets. They did not know how long that time would, would be. Was God still speaking and moving in the lives of individuals? I have no doubt that he was. But the next word scripture re records from heaven, the next words God speaks to his people Israel actually aren't in Matthew's gospel, they're in Luke's gospel. We read in Luke's gospel in the days of Herod, and this is where I asked you to turn there. So 37 B.C., to, to 4 B.C. or so, a certain priest named Zacharias, along with his wife, were blameless. They weren't sinless, but they tried to be, and they availed themselves of the sacrifices and so forth. So one night, Zacharias is on duty. There were more priests than there were things to do in the temple, so that they, they had a rotation. Verse 11, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zacharias. For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bury you a son, and you shall call his name John. You'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he'll be great in the sight of the Lord, and he'll drink neither wine nor strong drink. He'll also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he'll turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, before Messiah, before the Christ, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Describing John the Baptist, obviously, who goes before Jesus to fulfill all of Malachi's prophecies and to tell Israel, be ready, he's coming. But what makes this the perfect time? Well, didn't Daniel give us the time? Wasn't there something in Daniel chapter 9 that that gives us the exact number of years and therefore the exact number of days before the triumphal entry. And so Jesus had to be born a certain number of years before that time because he needed time to grow up. So Daniel's prophecy tells us that it's the perfect time. Okay, but that sort of begs the question, where did we get Daniel's prophecy? God. Why did God say it would be that many years? Because God knew it would be that many years. So that doesn't really answer the question. That doesn't tell us why. And there has to be a why, because God doesn't do anything without a purpose. We don't always understand it. But with God, there's always a why. So what's happening in those four intervening centuries? Let's back up. We'll get a running start at them. Let's back up another 400 years and, 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 and a little bit more. 930 B.C., Solomon dies, the kingdom divides. And we've been talking about that for a while on Wednesday nights, right? The northern kingdom of Israel falls two centuries later to the Assyrians. A century later, the southern kingdom of Judah falls to the Babylonians. And those who survive are, are almost completely dragged into captivity. The length of that captivity foretold in Jeremiah, 70 years. And we're getting back to Jeremiah in January, by the way. Looking forward to that. But during those 70 years, sure enough, the Babylonians are overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. And after 70 years go by, Cyrus the Persian issues a decree permitting the Jews to return. That happens in 538. And we read about that a lot last year in Isaiah, didn't we? 20 years later, the building of the temple is complete. That's 515 or so B.C. Read about that in Haggai. 60 years of, after that, we've got Ezra and the getting of the law in 458 B.C. 14 years after that, 445 B.C., there's Nehemiah. He's building the wall, trowel in one hand, sword in the other. And that brings us almost up to the time of Malachi, 430, 400, somewhere in there. Good news is by that time, Israel's back in the land. Babylonian captivity has ended. There have been several waves of returnees. Good news, Israel's back in the land. Bad news, still under control of the Medes and Persians. Good news, hey, they rebuilt the temple. Bad news, it's smaller than Solomon's temple and not that impressive. Good news, the priests have resumed worship because they kept track of who was of the line of Aaron 
and they were able to resume sacrifices and offerings. Bad news, they know the line of David too, but Zerubbabel of the line of David isn't the king, he's just a governor, and, and Persia's still pulling his strings. He's not on the throne. There hadn't been a king for 150 years at that point. There wouldn't be for the next 400 years, and there still hasn't been and won't be until Jesus sits on the throne of his father, David. So Malachi closes the Old Testament. For the next 100 years or so, the Medes, so we got the Persians, who continue to rule for the next 100 years or so. But during that time, a man named Philip rises to power in Greece and begins to consolidate the Grecian armies from the various city-states of the region. And 100 years after Malachi, 331 B.C., Philip's son, a man who's just 20 years old, grew up tutored by Aristotle, vows to conquer the known world. His name was Alexander. 331 B.C., Alexander conquers the Persian Empire and everybody else. He establishes Greece as the dominant, new dominant world power. Fulfills what Daniel prophesied 200 years earlier. And the historian Josephus tells the story as Alexander is pressing his campaign as he pushes forward to Syria and Egypt. He's planning to occupy Jerusalem along the way until the high priest meets him outside of the city with a copy of the scroll of Daniel and points out to him what we would call Daniel 8.21. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they're the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. And as Josephus tells the story, Alexander recognizes himself in the prophecy, spares Jerusalem and makes offerings to Jehovah. In fact, goes on to give the Jews full rights, full citizenship but doesn't relent in pursuit of his goal. And by 321, he accomplishes it. By 323, 321, somewhere in there, Alexander has conquered the entire known world. Greek becomes the dominant language. Greek culture influences, customs, supplants traditions throughout the region. And Alexander falls into a deep, deep fit of depression. Over the next two years, he essentially essentially drinks himself to death because he's gotten everything he ever wanted. And what happens to most people when they get everything that they want? (laughs) There are no more worlds to conquer. So that takes us again to 323 or so. When Alexander dies, his four leading generals divide the empire. Again, as God anticipates, because God's outside of time. Daniel 8.22 As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. Centuries before it happens, God prophesying that Alexander's kingdom will be broken into four. One of the four was given to a man named Ptolemy. He takes Egypt and northern Africa. Another man named Seleucus takes Syria. And the two promptly go to war. So we've got... The Ptolemaic Empire begins here on the heels of Alexander's rule because Ptolemy prevails and, and, and is able to exert him, his, his influence over what we would call Israel, Judea and, and, and Samaria. But while there's all this division in the region and there's border skirmishes and there's still fighting on the, on the, you know, on the outskirts of Israel... There's division within Israel. 323 to 198, during the Ptolemaic period, named for Ptolemy, the the first leader, Israel is under the control of Egypt. Many, by the way, still have deep affection for the Greeks during this time. This is the origin of, of the Hellenists that are referred to so often in the book of Acts and in Paul's writing. Hellenists were Jews that loved Greek culture. They were of Jewish ancestry, but they were, for all intents and purposes, Greek culturally. They had a passion for Greek philosophy, and that influenced how they thought about Judaism. As a result, they were liberal in their, their outlook and, and rising up against them. For every, every liberal revolution, there's always a conservative reaction. There were those who wanted, no, we need to get back to the old ways. We need to turn back to the traditions. Their motto was WWMD. What would Moses do? They became known as the Pharisees. 
they were legalists, and, and that's what they were in Jesus' day. They were, they were the orthodoxy. Both groups were influential, but when Greek culture was, you know, because Greek culture was still dominant, when the Egyptian king, even, even as the Ptolemies were reigning, when the Egyptian king wants the Hebrew scriptures translated so that everybody can read it, sometime between 284 B.C. and 248 B.C., he had them translated into Greek, and that translation is known as the Septuagint. Septuagint is an important translation, A, because Jesus quotes often from the Septuagint translation um, of, of the Old Testament. Also important because it's the easiest way to prove that the books of prophecy, especially Daniel and Isaiah, really are prophecy. Liberal scholars want to tell you that they were written in, in the hundreds, maybe even in the, in the, in the tens uh, before Christ, after the events that they describe, because how else could Daniel have known what was going to happen? How else could Isaiah have known how things were going to unfold? And the Septuagint proves that they existed 200 years before Christ. But even as this is going on, the Hellenists are working inch by inch to, to draw the Jews away from God's word. So when the traditionalists formed their political party, the Pharisees, the Hellenists formed their own, the Sadducees. We talked a lot about that as we finished up the book of Acts recently. Back to the timeline. We're up to... Next slide, there we go. So we're up to around 200 or so B.C., where... The, the Ptolemaic dynasty is, is beginning to wane because when Ptolemy number four dies, Ptolemy number five, Ptolemy Ep uh, Epiphanes, is only five years old. So the Seleucids seize the opportunity. Antiochus the Great, who's the descendant of Seleucus, they've been ruling Syria, they seize the opportunity to expand their territory. They invade Egypt, they invade Israel, they invade other territory. And you can see how the Seleucid Empire, whoop, go back to the map. Sorry, the Seleucid Empire pushes forward during that time into Israel and even down exerting influence into, into Egypt. This is where things start to get bad for the Jewish people. They were bad from the beginning because Antiochus the Great, who, who pushed the empire forward and, and supplanted the Ptolemies, he, he's no great friend of the Jews, but gave them the freedom to mostly live under their own laws. They could have their high priest, they could have their Sanhedrin council. Antiochus the Great dies in 187. His son, Antiochus Philopater, takes, takes, takes charge. He's mostly unremarkable, except he shows up in the books of Maccabees, part of the Apocrypha, that not inspired scripture, but, but pretty good history. He's remembered for his efforts to tax Jerusalem and later raid the temple treasury. He's also referenced, by, now that I think about it, in, in Daniel's prophecy. He's assassinated in 175 B.C. His younger brother takes power, Antiochus Epiphanes. Daniel 11 tracks the whole chain of events. Daniel 11, verse 20, There'll arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. So that's Antiochus Philopater. Short reign, not particularly remarkable except for taxation, and he tries to raid the temple te treasury. But verse 21, in his place shall arise a vile person to whom they'll not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Vile person is an understatement. From 175 to 164 B.C., he unleashes a reign of terror. Bans Judaism, destroys the scrolls, abolishes the sacrifices, desecrates the temple, pulls all of the furniture and fixtures out, except for the altar. On the altar, he sacrifices a pig and then takes the juices of the pig and scatters it around the whole thing to desecrate the temple, rededicates the temple to Zeus, and proceeds to commit atrocities against the Jews. Tens of thousands of Jews brutally killed under his reign. And that's also prophesied in Daniel. Daniel 8.11, speaking of Antiochus Epiphanes, hundreds of years earlier, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all of this and prospered. 
but only for a while. As, God is, as, as Daniel is receiving this from, from the Lord, the next thing he hears after that is a question. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? How long is Antiochus Epiphanes going to be able to do what he does? And the answer, Daniel 8.14, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. What do you suppose happens 2,300 days later, six and a half years later? A guy named Judas Maccabeus. That's not his name. Judas the Maccabee, Judas the Hammer, leads the Maccabean revolt starting six and a half years later, starting in 160, well, no, starting in 167 BC, and six and a half years later captures Jerusalem in 164 BC. So he begins the, some of the most brilliant guerrilla warfare he ever conducted and takes back Jerusalem. In the middle of in, early in this period in 164. That turns out to be an important date because one of the first orders of business once they retake Jerusalem is cleansing the temple, which they do, and they construct a new altar because the old one had a pig sacrificed on it, new furnishings, new fixtures, new implements, and they have a feast of dedication modeled after what was exampled in the Old Testament. Just one problem when they go to relight the seven branch candlestick, which is a fixture of the temple. The seven-branch candlestick was only supposed to burn pure oil consecrated by the high priest. They could only find one small jug of oil that had been consecrated by the high priest. One small jug that should have only lasted one night, because this is a very large, elaborate candlestick. It lasted eight nights, enough for them to prepare more. And the celebration, the commemoration of those eight nights is Hanukkah. So we're up to 164. The next 20 years or so continue a period that we call the Maccabean period. Judas Maccabeus continues to, to fight and expand the territory. Um, <coughs> he's killed in 161. Uh, Jonathan takes over, Jonathan Maccabeus. He's more of a diplomat than a soldier, but between the two of them, they're able to regain a lot of their independence, a lot of their territory, and, and in part because there's a lot of drama happening within Syria. When a new ruler takes over in Syria in 145, he flexes by having Jonathan kidnapped and killed. That's 143 BC. And that sort of ends the time of the Maccabees. But it starts a new period. Whoop, go back one. Sorry. The Hasmonean period. The Hasmoneans were descendants of the Maccabees. They just chose not to use that, that name, which wasn't really a name, it was a title. Hasmonean scholars differ. Was it, a, was it a place name? Was it an ancestor's name? That's the name that they took. And if we go to that next slide, so we've got Judas, the, 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 the first after Judas was Simon. Um, things go well for a while or so, but by the time John is in power, he's pushing back against the Samaritans. In fact, he destroys the Samaritan temple at Mount Gezerim. Alexander, when he takes control in 104, he starts a civil war with the Pharisees. 50,000 Jews are killed in this civil war, and at the end of the war, he has 800 of his enemy crucified, and as they're being crucified, he executes their families in front of them. Not a nice guy. So internal conflict within Israel grows. After Alexander, his wife uh, Salome, uh, his widow, takes over. She rules from 76 to 67, which is not on the timeline, unfortunately, because it's a chauvinistic timeline. Um, but, but she pursues peace with the Pharisees, and while she's doing that, her sons are fighting with one another. And after she dies, they go head to head, and, and instead of just pushing and, and shoving and calling one another names, uh, it becomes a shooting war. It becomes so long and so bloody. Both of them appeal to the new kid on the block, Rome, for help, because Pompey the Great has been fighting campaigns all over Europe and all over the region, um, all over the Middle East, expanding Rome's territory. 63 BC, he's advancing through Syria. They both reach out to him and say, hey, side with me. No, side with me. No, side with me. So Pompey does what the Romans do. 
He doesn't take sides. He takes over. 63, he brings his army down through Damascus and attacks Jerusalem, and after a three-month siege and even more bloodshed, he overthrows the city and celebrates by entering the temple, strolling into the Holy of Holies, and desecrating it. So they didn't know what to make of Rome before then, for the most part. So their introduction to Rome was Rome giving them a reason to hate them. That's 63 B.C., the beginning of Roman rule. What happens next? Rome appoints a guy named Antipater, who had an Idumean dad and a Jewish mom, governor of Judea. Idumean, descendant of Esau. Why is that significant? It fulfills up another prophecy. Isaac prophesied, speaking to Esau, Genesis 27, 40, by your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. So Esau is going to serve Jacob, is going to serve Israel. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. And that's fulfilled in, in the Herodian dynasty. Shortly before his death in 43, Antipater appoints his two sons, kings of Galilee to the north, kings of Judea to the south. Herod, we know Herod, Herod actually starts as king of Galilee. But after more drama and intrigue, he's run out of Galilee, he flees, he ends up back in Rome, and from Rome he launches a, an invasion of Judea, and he takes control, he launches an invasion in 40 B.C., takes control of Jerusalem in 40, uh, 37 B.C. So he's ruling and reigning in Jerusalem when the wise men show up in Matthew chapter 2 and ask, who is he who has been born king of the Jews? Herod, of course, was not born king of anything. He was appointed king of the Jews, and he was thoroughly hated by them from the beginning. And, and he tried to do something about that. In an attempt to win favor of the people that he was ruling, he actually marries a Jewish woman from the line of the Maccabees. He actually marries a Jewish woman, and he appoints another one of the Maccabees, Aristobulus III, high priest. Neither one did a lot to win the Jews over. They still hated him very much. Pretty busy 400 years. And I mean, we barely scratched the surface, right? But, but from 30,000 feet surveying four centuries, I think we have enough to answer our question, what made this the perfect time? Some scholars like to look at that time and, and, and they focus on Rome at the beginning of the millennium. Because Rome was building these massive roads that still exist today that, that linked the entire known world and travel was easy. And they were enforcing Pax Romana. So it was essentially a peaceful time within the empire. There was a one world language. Everyone spoke Greek. And scripture had been translated into Greek. And all of that made it a fertile time and an ideal time for the gospel to go forth and spread rapidly. And that's all true from the perspective of the Gentiles. But Jesus came first to Israel, just like Paul would later go first to Israel. Jesus came first to Israel. What made this the perfect time for Israel? I would argue it's everything we just talked about. I would argue it was the previous 400 years. Because if those 400 years didn't teach Israel anything else, they should have taught Israel that she needed a Savior. Rewind the tape again. Go back to the end of, of, of the Old Testament. Go back to Malachi. Go back to 430, 400 B.C. As Malachi is writing, as Malachi is prophesying, it's already obvious to anyone paying attention, just being in the right zip code isn't enough to save God's people. While they were in exile, the Jews consoled themselves, okay, everything will be fine once we get back to the land. And Jeremiah said it's only going to be 70 years, so we just have to hang on, and then things will be good again. Except by the time Malachi was was writing, they'd been back for, for at least a century. And they were still struggling. When we read the Minor Prophets, they're back in the land but still abusing their wives. Back in the land but not tithing. Back in the land but neglecting the temple. Back in the land but not teaching the word. Then comes Alexander. And under Alexander's rule, okay, knowledge and philosophy are going to save us. Knowledge and philosophy are going to set us free. 
the problem is they couldn't agree on what philosophy and, 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 and whose knowledge. The Hellenists said legalism is the problem. They were the progressives. They were the liberals. you got to loosen up. Take lessons from the world. The Pharisees were saying, no, no, the world is the problem. They were the conservatives. We need to go back to our roots. We need to apply the lessons that we learned from our fathers. Meanwhile, Israel keeps struggling. The next century brings Egyptian rule. And during that time, some no doubt believed, okay, if we could just get Scripture in the hands of the people. It, 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 the, you know, not everybody reads Hebrew every more, anymore. If we could just get Scripture into the hands of the people in a language that they could read and understand, so many of our problems would be solved. And somewhere in the, in the third century, the, the, the Septuagint was made available. And struggle and strife and captivity continued. In fact, it gets worse. Antiochus comes to power and, 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 and persecution reaches an all-time high. Because he comes not just against the people, but against the, their beliefs and their word and their God. And the people say, okay, if we can just get rid of, of Aristarchus' epiphanies, if we can just rule ourselves, if we can just, just take back our government, everything will be everything will be fine, except even when they did, that didn't mean freedom. It meant constant assault from their neighbors, and when they were willing to trade freedom for security, they ended up with neither. Eventually, they ended up with Rome. So by the time Herod is on the scene, Israel should have been sick and tired of being sick and tired. I mean, for, for four centuries... And four centuries before that, and four centuries before that, the history of Israel taken all together should have caused them as a people to say, we've met the enemy, and it's us. It's not Assyria, or Babylon, or Persia, or Greece, or Egypt, or Syria, or Rome. It's us. It's people. Matthew one twenty one. the angel says to Joseph, shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, which we know means that Jehovah is salvation. For he, Jesus, will save his people from their sins. We're going to look at Joseph this weekend, but read again what the angel said to Joseph. He shall save Israel from their sin, which is what Israel needed. It's what all of us need. Because what enslaves us isn't kings or armies or ideas or philosophies or opportunities or circumstances. What enslaves all of us, all of us, is the sinfulness of our hearts and the desires born of that sinfulness that lead us away from God into every kind of captivity. The national captivity of Israel just mirrored the individual captivity that everyone who's ever been born knows. And we're repeating the mistakes of Israel even today. The more we look for human solutions to the challenges of life, the more that we look to ourselves to solve the problems of living, the tighter the chains get, don't they? the heavier they drag. Flip over to Psalm 43. Back in the land, their temple rebuilt, the sacrifices reinstituted. Israel had 400 years to study their scriptures. 400 years to read Passages like Psalm 43, Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I'll go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on my harp I will praise you. O oh God, my God, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, 
for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Israel had 400 years to meditate on that and passages like it. And 400 years to encourage one another in it. So that when Messiah came, they'd be ready. They should have been so ready. But instead of looking to God to save them from themselves, they kept looking to God to save the selves that they were. Instead of looking to God to save them from themselves, they kept looking to God to save themselves the way that they were. They didn't want God to change them. They just wanted God to get Rome off their back. While God was prepared to do so much more, After 400 years, Israel should have been asking themselves, what is changing our circumstances again going to manage to do that that the last six or seven regime changes haven't accomplished? One regime to another regime. One dynasty to another dynasty. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. They should have been ready for something different, for, for someone Entirely different. When Jesus stood in the temple and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he sent me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the light bulb should have gone off. People should have said, Wait a minute, this is about way more than civil war. This is Psalm 43 stuff. This is about a battle for her souls. But they couldn't bring themselves to go there. Israel was so focused on the the picture that she had of Messiah who would save them for Rome, they couldn't see that God sent Jesus to save them from their sin. So obsessed with throwing off Rome's chains, they, 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 they couldn't see that God sent Jesus to throw off chains of addiction and anger and and, and, and need for approval and every other form of bondage. They were so preoccupied with, with overcoming the, the evil empire without. They didn't see that Jesus was taking on a battle against evil itself. So that men could be free within, mentally, spiritually, socially, relationally, physically free. Free from sin and death. Who could do that? Only someone much, much greater than the string of military rulers that had paraded through the land of Israel. Someone once said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, he would have sent an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, he would have sent an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a Savior. Again, Matthew 1. She'll bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Translated, God with us. So what about us as we wrap up this evening? None of us has been around for 400 years. But how about the last four years? Or for some of us, 40 years. What about the last 400 days? Or the last four months? What is God, through through circumstances, through trials perhaps, what's God trying to show you? Is it possible that the story that you're living has more than just a little bit in common with the story we've been talking about tonight, with the story of Israel. Is it possible if you trace back the days, the months, the years that brought you here tonight, have you been skipping and hopscotching from one bad situation to another one addiction, to another one relationship, to another one job, to another, every time telling yourself, this is going to be the one that fixes everything. This is going to be the, the time that it's different, except that it's never different. Because you're not different, not really. 
And wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> different setting, different surroundings, but, but, but same you and, and same pain. And the same persistent need for things that only Jesus can supply. Forgiveness. And then on this side of forgiveness, power. And peace. And joy and hope and rest. These things only come from Jesus. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. God sent Jesus at the perfect time time the time when israel had all the information that she needed to recognize jesus and the time when she'd had all of the experience to know that she needed jesus after everything that israel had gone through israel should have been dying to welcome jesus instead he died to welcome us so, so I need to ask as we wrap up, has the fullness of time maybe come for you this Christmas? Tonight, this week, the end of this year, has, has God brought knowledge and circumstances, knowledge and experience together to bring you to a choice point? To bring you to a decision? Have, have you had enough happen over the last 400 days, over the last however many weeks or months, to know that you don't have within yourself what you need? And it's not going to come from a, a, a job or a boyfriend or a husband or a house or a car or a child or a city or a state or an election or a method or a philosophy or a plan or a protocol. It's going to come from Jesus, and through Jesus, it's going to come through the Holy Spirit. Don't be like Israel. Don't miss Jesus. We, we are all conscious of, 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 of the enormity of our need. But Spurgeon said it so well, I have a great need for Christ and I have a great Christ for my need. Whatever that need is, let the knowledge that you have of Jesus and the experience that God has allowed to bring those things together and to make the surrender that we sang about at the beginning of the service real for you tonight and this Christmas and this new year. Lord, thank you for Jesus, who truly is the Prince of Peace. And we sing Christmas carols speaking of peace in the land, peace in the world, goodwill toward men. And we wince a little bit because that's so far from true on a global scale, so far from true on a national scale. But it can be so entirely true on a personal scale on an individual scale. And Lord, we pray that it would be. Holy Spirit, would you show us, again, the things that we need to put down, those things that we need to take up, those people we need to forgive, those, those works of righteousness we need to renounce. And would you teach us the peace that comes when we abide?